Father, we uh, thank you once again for this day. We thank you for keeping us. We thank you for all your grace and your mercy that you provided to us. We thank you for bringing us to here, to this Bible study, and help us to learn more and more to obey your word as you have given to us, especially as we look at this area of baptism, Lord. We thank you. Help us deepen our understanding of baptism, the importance of it, and what you have given it to us for. And Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give your name all the honor and all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So how has everyone been doing with the uh, homework? Hope everyone's been reading and uh, doing well with the homework. Now, there's one piece I wanted to... Last week, we talked about the centrality of Christ, right? The centrality of Christ. And so there, in part of your homework, I love this diagram that it has in there that talks about how Christ and especially the cross becomes more central in our lives, right, as time passes. So if you look, uh, this is page 29 in your, in your workbook. But you see how, you know, at your conversion, you got saved. So at your conversion, remember... All right, you're a sinner, you're dead in your sins, right? Then you awaken, made alive with Christ. So at that time, you probably have a lot of sin going on in your life, but you're probably not aware of it that much, right? You're a new babe in Christ, you know, you're, you're, you're spiritually immature. And so at that point, you know the cross was good, you know the cross is something that's important because you trusted in Christ, but... You really don't understand that you're sinning a lot, but you think you're pretty good. That's how we all, we know. I think I'm pretty good, right? So as you continue to grow in your understanding, right? Some bad arrows. <laughs> so as you continue to grow in your understanding of God's holiness, it also talks about you have a greater awareness of your own sin. Notice how the cross, right, continues to get bigger. And why do you think that is? Because you grow. But why does the cross become bigger? Because sin decreases. Okay. But our focus changes from ourselves more to Jesus Christ. Yes. You see the weight of the Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, the sin gets smaller, but you, you see the, you know, the depth of what all of that Christ had to go through right. on behalf of you for you. Right, yeah. And you should get a greater appreciation for what Christ has done for you. Right. Because now you're aware of your sin. Yeah. And it's you, who you really are. And uh -huh. who you really are. So as you grow, the, the really the gap becomes you realize that you're far worse than you thought you were. Yeah. yeah. Right? Early on, you thought you were pretty good. You know, you had a few oopsies and a few mistakes. Uh, but then as you began to grow and you realize how holy God is, you become more aware of your own sin. So the gap between you and God gets, your understanding gets greater. But then you appreciate the cross because the cross bridged that gap, right? And so, and as you grow, think about it. You will start to sin less but you'll feel worse about the sin you do commit. You actually think you're worse off, right? But that's a sign of actually spiritual maturity, right? You were, you were sinning more back here, but you didn't feel as bad about it. But when you realize how holy God is, and you grow, 
of the awareness of your sin, you actually start sinning less as you grow in the Lord. But when you do sin, oh, the Holy Spirit brings such conviction, and you feel bad about it. You're thinking, my goodness, how bad? This is, this is kind of what Paul is saying, right, in chapter uh, chapter 7, right? He's like, oh, who's going to save me? from this? And Paul was not a newbie, right? He just, his awareness of his own sin was so great, but that went, thanks be to God, right? And so I love that diagram because the cross and Jesus becomes more central to us as we grow in our awareness of his holiness and awareness of our own sin. Yes. This talks about the point of the virgin when, when there says you become a Christian in the text. Mm -hmm. Where is that point on the chart? Or is that oh, right here. Yeah, yeah. conversion. Oh, says, okay, well, uh, that verse? Mm -hmm. okay. That verse. This says the point of that. That's is, when is they, incorrect? That version is where they meet. But conversion is when you become a Christian. Right, conversion. Okay, is, so on that chart, that point is. Is right here, right? So when, the, when right these there. things begin to diverge, it's saying at the moment of your conversion. So not okay, conversion of the mind. Diverge. Oh, right, right. Oh, okay. Your conversion, right? Okay. So my conversion is a, a, a right. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, because I had to read this two times, because okay. I don't agree with it. Okay. Where is that? Um, the same page, mm -hmm. the last sentence, first paragraph. Okay. It says, "The longer someone is a Christian, two things happen: they have a deeper understanding of God's holiness and of their own sinfulness." So the part that I don't agree with is the longer a person is Christian, mm -hmm. because there are some people who are Christian who are there. Are, there are some people who are younger in Christ that are more mature in Christ, if that makes sense. True. And so I don't think it's necessary the longer you are a Christian. I mean, I, I agree with that. It is the longer you're a Christian, but I think it's the longer. I don't think it's stated correctly. I mean, because, you know, I can accept Christ and really have him in my heart. Well, way that I look at it <laughs> is that I can accept Christ, but I'm not. I'm not in Bible study. I'm not in Sunday school. I'm mm -hmm. not doing the things that, even though I've accepted Christ mm -hmm. or trusted in Christ, I should say. Mm -hmm. So I, so I could have done this for several years and not be where I should be. You sure, know right. I, I, I get your point. Yeah. I think the only point that they're making is that who, someone who really is following. Right. We're talking about a Christian who, the longer that they are really following Christ, you know, in this walk. That, and even in that case, it may take them long. But the longer, if they, if they, you know, God gets a hold of them and they start to grow, well, the longer they keep doing that, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. But I do get your point that yeah, you know, sometimes it takes longer for some <laughs> other people because they don't, yeah, right. They they fight against it like we talked about. Right. Yeah. yeah. But okay. if they start growing, then that conversion doesn't happen. I mean, this, this is like a movement. This is a movement. Yeah. It's always stop. Yeah. That's yeah. where you are. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you really should. It, it, it really, I mean, maybe it's a slow, yeah. it might be a slow process, right, where you think, hey, you've been a Christian for 10 years and you're only here. Yeah. Well, but it's still happening. It's just slow, right? <laughs> or someone else may have been saved for two, three years and they've already, you know, grown, right, but it's still happening. Yeah. Yeah. But the longer, but still, that same person who may be slow, the longer they're Christian, it might be slow movement. Okay. They'll okay. keep, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They'll keep on, right? Because there's no choice. In someone who's a Christian, yeah, there's no, I'm just stopping, I'm done. You know, <laughs> if you're a Christian, God is going to be sanctifying you, right? Yeah. And some Absolutely. of us are size small, and then some of us are medium, and some of us get to be large. <laughs> you said about the cross. Right, so right, yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it takes, yeah, yeah. Everyone matures at different levels, right? So, yeah. yeah, so we can't always, you know, sometimes we can say, yeah, you should be, but hey, thankful for the grace that you see, even if it's slow moving. Uh, you know, we all want sometimes our friends and, and fellow believers to be further along than we think they should be. But you know, God's in control of that. The point is that if, once you got to the bird, you get to the point of the bird and you're converted, you started the Christian process, right? Right, right. Yes. It's just a matter of how yes. quickly you move along. With yes, yes, okay. yes. Sometimes it's slow for others, and sometimes maybe seem quicker. Right. No, it, it'll, it'll happen. It. It'll happen. <laughs> Working on it. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Any other questions on the homework? Any other thoughts? We, yes. This is one addition. Of, I think also we, it, it presumes that um, we, we, we have to define the conversion thing because mm -hmm. conversion is not obviously here not meaning just verbally accepting Christ because right, right, actually right. I've read many testimonies of some believers who actually confess that 
they were in the church for many, many years, and they actually thought they were saved, and eventually they were led to the faith and convicted that their conversion was actually later. So yes. for such people, you can't really say that they were growing because they were not even Christian to begin with. They were just right. nominal Christians. They were not right. yet saved. And so if we're talking about conversion, we actually have to define that this is not right. something that's just externally visible all the time. Just because somebody's coming to church and professing Christ doesn't necessarily mean that they are saved. They actually have to receive their reassurance or test their spirit to know that they're true Christian. So with that being said, for those who say they have been converted and we don't see any change, we cannot necessarily say that they are truly saved. So the, the chart truly makes sense if we fundamentally know that if you are a Christian and you are growing, that should be the case because mm -hmm. that is what the Holy Spirit will do in your life in every day. Right. That's yeah, very good point. Yeah, so conversion really does talk about what we're going to talk about in terms of baptism. The reality is that someone has been born again, born from above, regeneration. Those, those terms you hear in the scriptures all talk about someone who has been changed, right, uh, that God has converted, right? Not just a mere profession of belief. Because like I say, many people can make profession. Well, I believe and really have not had this happen to them. And so, and then it may take a while before they actually hear that really that good news and realize, wait a minute, you know, I don't really think I'm saved, right? You know, so, and so yeah, you may not see the evidence of it because there was no fruit from it, right? So, yeah, very good point. So, when we're talking conversion, we're talking about people who have, yes, has been eternally changed by trusting in Christ, you know, alone, faith alone, right? Absolutely, more than just mere profession. Yes. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, does that work and vice versa, meaning can you be saved and changed inside, but you just don't know how to move forward? So you're kind of stuck where you are mm -hmm. because you don't know the next step. So you don't, you don't grow. Okay. But, yeah. I, yeah, I think there could be times when you have been converted, right, and you don't know the next steps, right? Mm -hmm. you know, and so you, you feel like you are kind of like, okay, man, I'm spending my... But there's something in you that should be like, I, I want to get to the next level, you know, and so that, that desires. So if you think that you got converted but, and, you know, you go, well, yeah, I think I'm saved. But there's no desire to obey God, no desire to move to the next level in him. Then you really have to question, right? There's nothing that's changed in me. I, I still want to live the way I used to live. Right, I'm not gonna say you know. Sometimes we get converted, you, you have that struggle, but there should be a struggle. I want to go forward, not quite sure how. You know, I need some. And this is where the church comes into play, right? You need somebody, right? Because there's no, you don't give birth to a baby and leave him in the alley. He will do that. What's the baby gonna do? <laughs> Die, right? Family has to nurture, give. You know, so a new Christian. Or even someone who feels like maybe I really haven't been growing like I should needs to get in with the family. That's when the church comes in. So you have discipleship going on. Someone's tell, here are the next steps. Maybe you've never been taught how to pray. That's when someone disciples you with it. Maybe you've never, uh, you don't know how to study the Bible. You want to. I would love to know more about the Bible. I don't know how to get started. Somebody at church ought to be able to help you, right? <laughs> Somebody said, you know, and then hearing preaching regularly, attendance. All of that are your next steps, right? Absolutely. So that's, a, that's an excellent question because people do get that way, and God never intended for a newborn baby to be on their own and try to live this Christian life alone, right? So the next steps are definitely surround yourself, get a, be a part of a church, right? Join a church, be under fellowship with other believers. They will help you get And then you find somebody in church, like, look, I need somebody to help me get to that next step. But doing it by yourself, you find out, man, I'm not able to really progress like I should, like I want to. And that's because you, you don't know what the next steps are. And many people do find themselves that way. That's why I always encourage them, please get yourself, and this is what this is where the church community is so important. Bible study, Sunday school, all these things, all part of the church that helps Christians to grow in their walk with the Lord. So, excellent question. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yes. All right, in chapter five, Chapter 5 in Mark? Chapter 5 in Mark. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. He did, yeah, it says he did not permit him because he wanted to go with him to go home to, yeah. So I think in, in this instance, Jesus had, to, had chosen his 12 to follow him, mm -hmm. right? And so, again, discipleship, it's not, you know, sometimes we think, well, I should just disciple everyone that comes to me. Sometimes you can't, mm -hmm. right? I say, and so Jesus is saying, no, I don't need you to follow me, but what I do need you to do is go home and tell everybody else what the Lord has done for you, right? Because there's sometimes when Jesus says, don't say nothing. You will see that too in Mark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't, don't say anything. Yeah. And what are they going to do? They're going to tell, they 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 tell us. Right, right. <laughs> Jesus, tell, Jesus tell us now to go tell them we don't say nothing. So <laughs> they got it back. Right? So, but in this case, yeah, I don't think Jesus is looking for another disciple. He's not saying, like, don't follow me in, in the terms of, uh, uh, you know, being a Christian or believing in me. But don't physically come along with me. I need you to go back. Go back to your home. <laughs> tell the good news, right? So, so Jesus has his twelve, and even in his twelve, we'll see he has three that he tends to focus in on as well. So sometimes we, in our discipleship, we got to think about it. What are those that we're going to concentrate on? It may not, we can't, you can't always disciple the whole world, but there can be a few that you can pour into. Because Jesus only had how many years of ministry? Three. three. Three, right? So that's why the crowds weren't necessarily all. I mean, he would preach to them. But he was focusing on those two and those three because he knew he was going to leave them with another mission. Right? So, yeah. So, good question. All right. And we'll be getting, we'll actually, we'll be getting that because we'll be preaching through Mark starting in February. So, we'll, we'll definitely get to this section. All right. All right. Let's, so, baptism. So, give me your thoughts on your first experiences of baptism. Like, what, what were your earliest impressions of baptism in the church? Like church period of what happened to me? Uh, just yeah, church, like maybe you saw you were young or whenever you and you saw somebody getting baptized. What were you some well, of your earliest This is what impression? happened to me. Okay. He turned twelve, uh -huh. and they say it's time to get baptized. Time to get baptized. So they at, at the end of BBS, everybody lining up to get baptized. Okay. That's when you get your certificate, mm. that's what it was. And so it was no, do you believe in Jesus? Right. Have you? It was no confession. It was nothing. You turned. Okay. A certain age, and everybody was getting everybody baptized. Else. Okay, yeah, yeah. Anybody else have that? Um, it was just time for you. <laughs> All right, so scary. No, okay, yep. So that's when you get sprinkled. Okay. Okay. You get baptized as a baby? Yeah, when you sprinkled as a baby? Yeah, just sprinkled, though. I mean, okay. But well, as a baby, it wasn't you were a baby. choice that I made. <laughs> right. Not the choice that I made, but you know what I mean. It wasn't, I was, it was done when I was a baby. Right, okay, right. Yeah. So okay. that's, you know, and now it's, now it's, it's different. Right. Okay. All right, so it's simply a bit right? Yeah, prison, the prison I live at. You go, I'll go. <laughs> right, right, right. right. You go, I go. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It was like a green mile deal with me. Like, I better right. love God. Like, right. I better really know what I'm doing. Like, I knew the seriousness of it because everybody was like, you getting baptized today? I was like, well, let's pray. And I'm like, well, what's going to happen to the water? Like, you know, I mean, they were really serious. You know, I knew that it was serious, and I was happy because you get to wear a new dress and get to do all of this stuff. Right. But then, like, I got to the water, and I was like, well, something, what's going, something's going to change. Something's going to happen. But I didn't know what the change was until well after. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was almost grown. I was like, oh, so that's what I did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Isn't it amazing how just in this room, the different perspectives and stuff that, you know, our upbringing, what we were exposed to, you know, what is baptism, you know, what's the meaning behind it, why did we get baptized, was it appropriate or not, right? Because sometimes it is. You just get to a certain age, and our parents be like, look, I'm worried about you. We need to get some water. Right? You know, it's like, we need to get baptized. And so, and, and so we have to really come to a better understanding of what is the, the purpose and the reality of what baptism is all about. Right? So in here now, if you're looking at in your, in your book, in the introduction, it, talks, it kind of talks about Thanksgiving and how you have a holiday. It, commemor it commemorates something that happened before. right? And it goes on to say towards the bottom, it says something similar happens within the church when we celebrate the baptism of the new disciple of Jesus. No, disciples don't get baptized every year. But the rite of baptism itself is very much a participation and a commemoration of something rather than a simple ritual. Specifically, it is a commemoration of a person's salvation. So as we take a deeper look at the practice of baptism within the scripture, we'll see that it is much more than a celebration or even a commemoration. Indeed, baptism is our first act of obedience as disciples of Christ, right? And so uh, with that, if I can get somebody to read Romans, we'll read that passage there, Romans 6, 1 through 11. Romans 6, chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or are you unaware that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him because we know that Christ having been raised from the dead will not die again. Death no longer rules over him for the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So it talks about how ritual washings and other forms of baptism were common practice for the Jews, right, in, in, in the Jewish culture uh, before the launch of the early church. In fact, it even says Jesus himself was baptized by John the Baptist. We'll be looking at that in Mark at the beginning of his public ministry. And for that reason, the authors of New Testament epistles included a number of instructions for incorporating the ordinance of baptism as a core practice of the church. And it goes on to say that an ordinance is a spiritual practice that demonstrates a person's faith in Christ. Or you can think of it this other way, that this is something that Jesus has ordained that the church should do, right? And so baptism is one, and the other is communion, communion right? The Lord's Supper, right? Two ordinances that are in the church that we should be doing, that God has commanded us to do. So as we take a look at this, baptism really is a picture of salvation. So, you know, Paul's He's you know, in the middle, so if you look at the big, bigger context, Paul's talking about salvation. He's talking about you know being uh, you know the death that we got through Adam, but being alive through Jesus. You know, and then it's how some people thought, hey, you know, I can you know I get saved, I can keep on sinning. He said, no, you can't keep on sinning. How can you think that, right? You don't just get saved to get a get out of hell card, right? Get out of hell free card. No, there's a there's something that has changed in you fundamentally, right? And so this is what he's talking about: how God's grace provides forgiveness for all of our sins, which is the key to eternal life. And so in these opening verses, Paul makes it clear that the disciples who have received this grace cannot continue in sinful patterns that once defined them, right? 
is the process of making this point that Paul used the practice of baptism to paint a picture of our salvation uh, through Christ. So when new disciples are baptized in the church, right, they're immersed in the body, in, the, in a body of water, right? Mm -hmm. They are brought down into the water. So we dump you, put you in the water. Just as Jesus was what? Brought down into the grave after his death on the cross. Yet, like Jesus, we don't keep you under the water because you might drown. Uh, <laughs> we bring you up out. You don't remain in the water. Jesus didn't remain in the grave. And so they raise out again from the water, right? That's symb symbolic representation of Christ's resurrection. And that's the key to Paul's wonderful reminder, verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And so the practice of baptism serves as the object lesson that helps the disciple gain a better understanding of what it means to be saved. Now, I love this question. In what ways can salvation be compared to a type of death? In what ways can salvation be compared to a type of death? Are we dying to our old self, becoming yeah. a new creature in Jesus Christ. Yeah, dying to our old self, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so, so salvation, we often talk about, yes, it is um, becoming, you know, re receiving eternal life, but there's also a death that goes on, right? And that's that old self. Anything else? Absolutely. So, so in baptism, right, it symbolizes this reality that before Christ, you were what? <coughs> dead in sin. You were dead to God and kind of alive in sin. You want to think about that one, right? Dead in sin, but kind of alive to sin, right? Dead to God. God came and he saved you. Now, all of a sudden, it's reversed, right? So now you're alive to God, alive in God, and should be dead to sin. Mm -hmm. Now, that old, you know, that old flesh is still around. That's right. Right? So, so, you know. so Christians are a unique creature because they have two natures going on. So you, all new, new Christians, you need to just understand this is why sometimes Christians are in turmoil. It's because they thought, well, if I thought the king of Jesus, I would, you know, have no problems, right? Thought so everything would go well. Well, the problem, the issue is that old nature is still lurking around, right? And what what does he want to do? Sin, right? He want to do everything contrary to God. You got a new nature, a new heart that wants to alive to God, and they're they're opposed to one another, mm -hmm. right? So you know, so there's always a war going on within the Christian. Right? So if you're always at ease with sin, sin doesn't bother you. Just again, examine yourself, right? So there should be something going on that's going ah. I know I messed up, but it bothers me. You know, uh, that's because you've been made alive to God. Go ahead. And I like the terminology the Bible uses about being a slave to sin. Yeah, because yeah. what happens that too, when, yeah. you're, you're, when you're uh, born again is that you're no longer you might sin, mm -hmm. but you're no longer slave. Slave to right, mm -hmm. right. It's not going to drive you. Right. Rather, than, rather than, you know, God uh, impose spirit you back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You think about it that at our conversion, the the power of sin has been broken. The presence. Right. Presence of sin is still there, yeah. but the power of sin meaning I just I don't you don't have to sin all the time, right? Where you were a slave to sin, yeah, I, I do what my master tells me, right? <laughs> but now I've, the power of sin has been broken, so I can flee temptation. I can you know, look for the way out, right? Versus looking for the way in, you know. I, I can I, I have power to say no as I grow in the Lord, and so baptism is a demonstration of that, right? So you go in that water. Symbolizing you dying, going in that grave, just as Jesus did, and you come up out of the water. Now, is there anything magical about the water? No. Because, <laughs> no. I mean, I mean, it's cold. <laughs> it's, yeah, other than that, right? The thing is trying to get it warm, but it's cold. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's nothing, nothing mad. I mean, because if that was the case, boy, we would. Well, who was it talking about? They just line you up and say it's time to go, right? I mean, we would do that. I mean, if it really was magic in the water to get you saved, boy, I'm, just, I'm getting every sinner off the street and taking them in and baptized, right? That's all it takes. 
we just ducking folks, right? Yeah. Getting in, I'm getting back in there just in case. Just in case. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if that's the issue, but the water is not, right? There's a, there's a, the water symbolizes a greater reality. Mm-hmm. What's already happened to you at your conversion, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And so, so, so you think of it that way. So it's not a because is baptism necessary for salvation? No. Roman Catholics would say yes. But we, if you look at the scriptures, because all throughout the scriptures, you're saved by grace alone, Christ alone, not by baptism, faith alone, Christ alone, right? So no, because what about the thief on the cross? That's right. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. And what if you can't find no more? Right. <laughs> you know, he up on the cross. You know, he like, you know, I mean, what if Jesus said, you know, this day, well, wait a minute, not this day, but as soon as you get down and find some water, get right. baptized, right. then you'll be with me in paradise. Right. Well, he in bad shape because he's about to go out. He's dying. Can't get off the cross. No, he said, no, this day, you recognize who I am. This is the king. So you will be with me in paradise. Now, it doesn't mean that baptism is unimportant. Not necessary for some, but it is a commandment from the Lord that we should take seriously to obey and do. Because as it goes on, baptism is a public declaration. Mm -hmm. This is why we do it in church service. This is why you invite family and friends, right? Because it is a public, yeah, personal, you know, you personally has done, but now you want to let the world know that I am following Jesus. You know, I've given my life to him. He saved me, and I am fought, I'm publicly recognized. Because, and if you don't want to get baptized, I always struggle with that because God <coughs> says if you're shamed only before men, right? right. Yeah. You're shamed only before the Father. I mean, so, mm-hmm. so it's a public declaration that we're not shamed, and so it serves that as a desire to tell, and also tells the church community: here's a disciple who's getting baptized and wants to follow. We're all now committed to helping that brother, that sister walk with the Lord. So uh, that, that's so important. Yes, brother. My, I can, I'm speaking from a personal experience. You know, when you when you've been baptized and been in the church and sin kind of pull you back out mm-hmm, there, mm-hmm. you have to have the church family to pull you back. Believe that's right. me. That's right. When I was calling out to this last time. I just prayed for anybody to call me or anything mm-hmm. because it seemed like I couldn't find myself to get back. Mm-hmm. I just, anybody from the church, I don't know how I want to go to church center. I just said, if I can get a phone call yeah. where I can break away, yeah. that's where the church family come in. And it's, it's yeah. you get called back out, it's, it's really tough if you don't have a church family with you to pull you back in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, brother, for sharing that because that's why we, we should not take. <clears throat> Even the act of baptism so lightly, you know, it's like, oh, church is over. Let me get, kind of leave, you know. And I know they got that baptism thing. You don't even know who it is. You you want to see. You want to celebrate. You want to you want to say, okay, this person is coming. What can I play a part maybe in helping them? Maybe I won't see them like Brother Mike said. Maybe they got baptized right, and they were kind of faithfully coming for a month. Then they dropped off the next couple of months. Maybe I should call them and ask. Ask the secretary, do you have this person's number? How can I reach? Mm-hmm. You know, I haven't seen this person. Maybe because the deacons, you know, don't just leave it up to somebody else all the time, right? Maybe the deacons have been so busy, the pastors have been so busy with other things they haven't quite noticed yet. Let me, because I was at the service, I celebrate with them, and I don't see them now. They're not walking with the Lord. Make baptism a glorious celebration and a commitment that we have each other's back, right? And we want to help one another. So simple. I think about the reason why I got baptized the first time I've been baptized mm-hmm. the second time for the right reason because I yeah. know what I was doing mm-hmm. Lord, I don't know why but the first time as I stated it was just a pact right. and and I was thinking that at that time it was because it was just a requirement of the church yeah mm-hmm. this is just what we do this yeah. is another practice even within the mm-hmm. church mm-hmm. so I'm thinking when people get up and walk away walk out and don't yeah. stay behind it's just a yeah requirement of yeah. the church. It's just one of the church's practices. Yeah. And so therefore it has no meaning. Yeah. Absolutely. And so it's easy to get up and go. Yeah, it can very well be. Some people, yeah, the, because they because they got it, or, or they might say, well I'm gonna get it out the way. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, because that, that 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 takes care of it for me. And so then I just kind of keep on living. Then you think back, well yeah I got baptized. 
I'm not following Jesus. Right. I'm not, right. you know. And, and notice, <coughs> it always comes after, right, mm -hmm. the salvation, right? That, that, that we believe, right, especially coming from Baptist tradition, that we believe that after one has been converted and saved, then they are baptized, right? Uh, and so that is the say you're supposed to be following the Lord, right? Not just get baptized and then you can follow whether you want to or not, right? Mm -hmm. But baptism coming because you truly have been changed mm -hmm. and you want to follow the Lord. And it's a part of obedience, right? Mm -hmm. It comes in the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. We see it there, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, doing what? Baptizing them, right? So inheriting that call is first a call actually to go out and spread the gospel. Because and then once they come to the Lord, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Actually, you can't accomplish this commission outside of the church. This is another reason why you need the church. If you're going to make disciples, you need the context of the church. Because where are you going to baptize them at? In your pool? Should you be the one baptizing? Right? If you come out trying to find, you know, it's in the context of the church that is teaching and that is baptizing, right? And guess what? This is commission, not a suggestion. It's not optional. It's commandment from the Lord, right? We must be obedient. To this call that God had. I mean, and what do you think about that? It asks the question, how do you how do you respond to the truth that baptism is a command from Jesus? How do you respond? Like you <laughs> like, right, like, go ahead and do it, right? Yeah. But some people, you know, kind of balk at that and like they, they treat the Great Commission or treat those things as it's optional. Or like there's two different levels of Christian, right? There's these Christians that they do the disciple thing, they get baptized, and then there's, you know, just an ordinary Christian over here. No, 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 we're all, <laughs> there's no tiered thing going on here. We're all to make disciples. This is the mission of the church. This is what we should be doing. Right? That goes back to what we were talking about last week, Pastor. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me, the centrality of Christ, because if Christ is central in your life, mm -hmm. you want other people to have him central in their lives, and you're right. willing to go out and share. You have that passion to, to go and make disciples and yeah. you don't get stuck on oh my career and all this other stuff because it's nowhere in the bible says that at least for me was talking about where our identity was and when they say tracy you need to be cpa it doesn't say that it says mm -hmm. tracy you need to go out and to share my word and to share my gospel and to make disciples that's what it's all about this whole mm -hmm. christian wall it's not about me getting something yeah. out of it it's truly about me sharing jesus yes, christ absolutely absolutely and yeah go ahead and just piggyback mm -hmm. off, and it also starts in the home. Um, parents Spirit. actually teaching their kids, yes. you know, what the importance of baptism is. Right. And I got to say, like, that's what my mom taught me, not just saying, well, yeah, you need to be baptized. Right. You know, but what, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And not just saying just being dipped in the water, like, okay, you need to learn your ABCs, accept, believe, and confess mm -hmm. that you do know Jesus. But then also telling them that the water is not going to save you. That's just a symbolic reason, you know, to show everybody that you do believe in Christ. But, you know, you have to explain now, like, I don't feel like parents are actually teaching their kids that. Yeah. So now when kids come to church, it's like, okay, I'm in church. You know, I'll get baptized because mom and dad told me to. So, right. you know, even when I accepted, you know, trusted in Christ, you know, I knew, I, I truly believed him, but now when I got baptized, you know, it's just like, okay, I need Jesus, go ahead, dip me in the water, so this could be, a, but I, I believed him, but I was just like, okay, y'all need to get me, get this over with, because, you know, I, I don't want, you know, everybody to see that I get baptized, but, you know, and it's also, I, I don't do water. So I need you to hold on to the water too right. long. Right. You know, right. one, two, three, pick me back yeah. up real yeah. quick. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, but honestly sharing what, you know, baptism really is now. Absolutely. And I think parents are falling away because we're trying to be buddy-buddy with our kids instead of telling them the truth and training them in the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. I, and, and it does. I mean, the church properly teaching and parents really reinforcing and teaching that at home, right? So that we don't get to some of the stuff that maybe some of us experience that, you know, we might say that, but practically, we're like, man, I need this person saved. So 
just get that, you know, you ain't you ain't trusting in Christ, ain't you 13? <laughs> you know, just go ahead and as if we think that you know the water has done something, you know, like it's magical. And so so we say we believe one thing, but practically, you know, we're magicians. You know, we think somehow this water's gonna do something because it's our children. We'll tell everybody else, no, no, wait till they trust. But when it comes to yours, you'll be like, wait a minute now, I want to make sure they all, see, you know. Keep and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, your kids, that's not, yeah. But you, we, we want to make sure it's proper, right? You know, and so, and I, you know, because even, even my daughter, my oldest daughter, you know, she kept talking about it at first, but then being a parent, I have to discern. I think it's because your brother got baptized. And I really got to have a conversation, right? Do you really, do I, do I see evidences? of a change in your life. These are the things that parents have to do and get wrestle with their children, right? It's like, you know, do I really see evidence that, yeah, God is, you know, I know you're immature, you're a child and everything, but there's still, still be some evidence when I see a change. Do you feel sorry when you disobey me? <laughs> <laughs> you come back and say, mommy, daddy, I'm sorry, right? You know, I, I felt bad about it, right? I don't know why I felt bad. Well, maybe that's the Holy Spirit. Just, you, know, you know, you look for these things as parents, right? Not just automatically, if you're a certain age, you need to go get baptized. Right? And you talk about being embarrassed, over here in, in the United States, it doesn't cost us much to get baptized. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right now, you know, you get baptized, do it as many times as you want to. But imagine Christ has saved you and you're in a Muslim country. And they are getting baptized. And when they get baptized, it's a public declaration. That puts a target on their back. And I'm saying I'm following Jesus, not Muhammad. And everybody that finds out, you know, in the village, wherever they live, in the city, you said your son got baptized? He's a Christian? You know, you could be losing your job, your home, your land, or your life. But they get baptized over there because they count the cost and found Christ to be worthy. We dump folks over here all the time, and folks still don't really understand what it means to follow Jesus. So baptism is serious. It's a public declaration, right? Mm -hmm. Where other folks are dying in other countries to get baptized because they want to identify with Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, let us not take it so lightly about getting baptized. It's a wonderful, serious thing. That we, you know, that we should be doing, right? That, that shows. And, and it, it goes on to say that the practice of baptism continues to benefit the church in many ways. For example, baptism is a shared experience among all the disciples of Christ. It helps Christians join together as the body of Christ. Paul made that clear when he wrote, For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. So public baptism are also a fantastic opportunity for evangelism as new disciples stand to declare in front of all witnesses their intention to follow Christ. So that's a wonderful thing that happens. Now, just as circumcision, take it off, you know, contrast and compare. Circumcision of the flesh was a sign and a seal Right, of the circumcision of the heart, right? It's a sign under the old covenant. So in the Old Testament, when they got the male was circumcised, right, it was a an outward sign and seal, right, of what should have been a circumcision of the heart. In the New Testament, under the new covenant, baptism, right, is a visible sign and seal of the baptism of the spirit. Right, so baptism of the Spirit happens we in our conversion, and so water baptism is a sign and the seal of that same in the new covenant. So you see a difference there, right? So that's what, this what baptism does for us under the new covenant versus circumcision under the old covenant. Now, what are some differences? We talked about Roman Catholic, but we believe, to give you all some... Uh, 20 cent words. We believe in what we call the 
believer's baptism, or as theologians call it, you are credo Baptist. But you have other faith traditions who believe in infant <coughs> baptism, which we call Pado Baptist. Okay? So credo means creed. So you made a creed to follow Christ, a profession of faith. Right? This is this is a position that we hold here at this church in the believer's baptism, that who should get baptized? Believers. Those who have trust in Christ. Now, if you are a pedo baptist pedo means child or infant, then you baptize in babies. Now, who does that? Well, some Presbyterians, some Lutherans, right? Uh, but at the same time, they don't where they distinguish between Roman Catholics is they don't believe that baptism is necessary for salvation. Right? But they will. And why... Why would they baptize infants? Well, they see a continuity between the old covenant <coughs> circumcision, because you would circumcise a child, and they would only baptize infants of believers. They see a, a continuity between the old covenant where you would circumcise a baby, right, a male child, right, as part of the Jewish community. So they say, hey, that continuity goes on to the new covenant, so we baptize infants that belong to believers, right? Whereas we as credo Baptists, we see a disconnect between an old covenant and say, no, even though they were baptized, circumcised, we notice that circumcision doesn't save, but we notice that all the passages that talk about baptism water seem to talk about immersion and, and being saved in the spirit, right? So we believe a disconnect there, and so we don't baptize infants, right? We believe that it takes place after your conversion. But these are, these are beliefs now. This is not enough for us to, uh, we would call this secondary doctrine, that we, we may be in different churches based on that, but we can still fellowship. So I can fellowship with my Presbyterian. I pray with some Presbyterian pastors, right? You know, uh, we can, but, you know, when I join their church, you know, eh, I might not want to baptize my babies, right? You know, or, or them coming to a Baptist traditional church. Right, that's what makes us different. But... We have the primary doctrines, right, in common. Who is God? Who is Jesus? Salvation, the gospel, all of that we share in common. So, yeah, we don't need to, I don't need to say, oh, you baptized baby, you're not a Christian. No, no. <laughs> Neither should they look at us and say, oh, you, you know, you, you got to wait till they make a profession before, you know. But there's, this is just to let you know that there are differences, right, uh, between certain Christians as, they, as they're trying to interpret the Bible and look at it. They're laying a little differently. Uh, than we do. Any, any questions? Thoughts? Yeah. You said the Pado Baptist was that they they don't believe or that they do believe that baptism is necessary for salvation. No, they don't. They yeah. Don't Typ Ty yeah, typically, especially Protestants, okay. right? So Protestants that break away from Roman Catholics, right? They don't believe it's That's necessary. Right. Whereas the Roman Catholics baptize baby, but they say, yeah, they, you got to do that. Otherwise, they're not saved. But then they also believe that you can lose your salvation because salvation is by works and faith. So you can get baptized as a baby, still lose your salvation, and you can keep on working. That's the Roman Catholic doctrine, right? But yeah, Protestants don't think. So my, so my question is, uh, if you don't think this is, saves you, then why are you doing it? Right. That's, it. Like, you know, that's, that's my question. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's not in the Bible. I mean, you never see that in the New Testament. Right, right. So um, never, there's no impact. Yeah. Yeah, believers' baptism is what we see in the New Testament. That's what the disciples did. That's what the apostles did. They baptize you once you believe, and that's what. Yeah, they would they would they make they would make they would make an argument in some of the passages, like in Acts, or, or the jailer um, Paul and Silas that says, "Well, you believe, preach, and we baptize you in all of your household." So they would think all your household, you know, could be they could be children and babies, and then they all got baptized, even though we don't hear <laughs> explicitly. But I think if you look at the text closely. You can believe that all they probably all were preached to, and probably all came from a profession of faith. But yeah, but that's what, that would be one of their arguments. <laughs> but I agree with you, brother. <laughs> but yeah, that would be one of their arguments. But I would ask that question to them: like, well, why do you do it if it doesn't? If you don't believe it's saved, what's the benefit, right? So, but you know. But anyway, just to let you know, that's that is the difference. 
that we may find, right? But there are some, like you say, and there are some strains, I would say, maybe in Lutherans that believe in baptismal regeneration, right? Uh, some Lutherans, I think, you know, Lutherans, I can't pin down, they have a weird understanding about baptism sometimes. They know, you know, they think it's a means of grace that God bestows in the water. I, I can't quite figure it out, but uh, but we believe, right, this is this is what we practice as, as believers' baptism, right? Uh, that upon a profession of faith, right, upon your, upon your conversion, yes, it symbolizes what Christ has done and what Christ has done on the inside of you. So then the question becomes, all right, what are some next steps? You know, it asks, what are your next steps? If you're here today and you're a Christian, you've not been baptized <coughs> since coming to Christ, right? Maybe that should be your next step. Right? Now, you don't need to, now we, let's be careful with rebaptism, right? Because sometimes you be, you know, you be trying to get baptized every year. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to do that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you know that, yes, I was a Christian when I got baptized, that is sufficient. Even though you may have walked away and you come back and you rededicate your life and felt, oh, I feel like I need to get baptized. No, you know, that's not necessary, right? <laughs> but if you realize, hey, I was a teenager, and I know now I would not say, uh, but now, yeah, I would really want to get baptized again because that really means I have not really been baptized since my conversion, right? Now, that would be very meaningful to do that. So, so what is your possible next step? Or have you been converted and for some reason you just don't, I don't think it's important enough. Maybe you should get baptized, right? Even those that may be fearful of the water, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we can. Hey, we had a young lady here. You know, she she moved away, but she 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 she, she was definitely afraid of water because I think she had an incident. She almost drowned, and so we we you know we were praying. She was praying, and we baptized her. She shot up real quick. When the Holy Spirit, she just, <laughs> I could tell she was like one second too long. So, but she did it though. Oh, she did it. She did. And she got baptized. So yeah. So, but that that's that's exactly. And and also like other terms that you may hear, we talk about immersion. We believe in immersion. Simply because the, the Greek word they use baptism is baptizo, um, really means to, to dip or to immerse, right? And we see that picture in Romans, right? What does it talk about? It says you, let's go back to it. You were baptized, and it goes verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him, right? That's the picture. Buried. How do you get buried if you just kind of sprinkle them? <laughs> buried, immersed, and then brought them out, right? So that's the picture, right? Now the mode of baptism, this is the, it doesn't mean that we, you know, that if there were some circumstances that prevented immersion, that it would not be valid. But that is the general immersion we believe because that's the picture we get of being buried with Christ, like in the ground, in the grave, and then coming up out of for resurrection, right? So that's why we believe in immersion, right, as, as part of, of what we do in terms of being baptized. We did. Then, yes, we did have a special case, didn't we, Pastor? Was yes, we did. Be? We did. We uh, had a, a young lady who had Down syndrome, right? Yeah. And so that was going to be an issue with getting in the water. So we did pour. We poured yeah. vigorously to make sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, so yes, so there are times when, yeah, when exceptions you made. And again, that's because we, we don't believe that if you don't get immersed, somehow you're not saved. Right. So that's, again, helps us, right, understanding what true salvation is. Then here's the other thing. Should you get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, or should you get baptized Jesus in name. Jesus' name? name. <laughs> Thoughts? about that yesterday. Um, <laughs> when you see that Jesus said that, then to me, I understood the relationship that Peter had with Jesus, and he understood who Jesus was, and he and he understood when Jesus said, you, "When you've seen the Father, you have seen me," and also, you know, you recognize the times that he was in, that his life was being almost taken. So he, he just made quick and simple, I baptize you in the name of Jesus, because he realized that Jesus, that he was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Whereas, he, and whereas Jesus taught, 
in the name of. Then you ask the question, what is the name? Mm -hmm. So to me, neither one of them were really wrong. I may be wrong, but to me, neither one of them were really wrong. It was the time that these guys were in, that what period, what was going on around them, and also Peter's understanding of who Jesus was. Okay. Anyone else? Any other? that I may have life. And then he left the Holy Spirit here with me to lead and guide me in all truth. So I would say that when I go down as one, I'm going down by the Trinity, by mm -hmm. okay. all three of them. Yeah. yeah. One, so. yeah. I, I, I agree. I think as Barry was kind of hinting there, talking about, is that even when Peter did it, and we see that in the book of Acts when mm -hmm. he mentions that, really it is who is Jesus right who is his office when you mention his name it really does incorporate all of that right he and the father are one and the work that Jesus did on the cross right now some people want to say well if you're not baptized in the name of Jesus your baptism is invalid and I've heard that argument too right uh, but if you do baptism in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, who is the Son? Jesus, Jesus. right. <laughs> it's him. Right. He's in there. So, not like we missed him, right? So, so, so I prefer definitely to follow what, you know, if I'm going to follow someone, I'm going to follow what Jesus said anyway. Because he said, you know, baptize. And I love it since, since you said that all persons of the Trinity right. are involved in our our salvation. Yes, the Father and His divine election and sovereign choice. Then He sends the Son who dies and He does the work of redemption. Then the Holy Spirit who then comes and He seals us, right, until the day of redemption is complete with our bodies, right? So all three are a part. And so I think that's a good model. But if you got baptized in Jesus' name, hey, Jesus, everything, that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. Don't say that's invalid, nor should someone come back to you mm -hmm. and say, well, you didn't get baptized in Jesus' name? Yeah. yeah well, you just tell them, yeah, I did. It's the son. It's That's fine. It works, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so don't don't let people get that hung up, you know, put that on you as well. <laughs> I, I've, I've heard some of those uh, arguments as well. Yeah. All right. Any, any questions? Baptism. Anything else? So your engagement here, I love this. That's right. It says, write an invitation to your church's next baptism service, which is Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Someone you, something you can send to your friends, neighbors, family members who are not yet disciples of Jesus. And it says here, you can use the following things. So uh, we're blessed. Uh, Sister Alexis is getting baptized Yay. on Sunday. Uh, Brother right. Travis, I think, is scheduled, yes, on Sunday. So we got two candidates. This is awesome. They can use it. We can invite people to come and witness how timely this is, right? That, that to show the wonderful thing of what baptism is all about. And it can be a wonderful witness. So if you have guests who come, right, and maybe they still have some questions, you can begin to, to tell them. Now that you, you know, we've heard this, we've gone, we've studied it, you can say, let me tell you what was going on with that, right? Did you hear the pastor say how that symbolized, you know, Jesus' death, burial, resurrection? And this is his public declaration that he's going to, this person is getting ready to follow Jesus. So when you invite your families, and sometimes maybe you have family that'll come, they don't know what's going on, maybe they're not saved. This is a wonderful opportunity as a witness to do this so that people can understand that you intend to follow Jesus, right? That's what the truth is. The practice of baptism is a corporate affirmation of the transformation that has taken place in one's life, you know, as we follow Jesus in our baptism. All right. Good stuff. Pastor, I yes. like this um, mm -hmm. engagement. It really like stopped me, like, who would I invite to the baptism? But I'm thinking about we're here today, and we've done the lesson, and we understand the importance. Right. What about the rest of our church body? Could we send, mm -hmm. we send out a broadcast message and say, hey, baptism is this coming Sunday. Right, and we right. have Travis and Alexis. We need to come out and support them as a church pastor yeah. because yeah. it's just not like another event that we're having, but this right. is something yeah. very important yeah. as a church body that we're doing, and we need to let everyone know. Because sometimes we get into the tradition, oh, we got communion on first Sunday, yeah, and we yeah, got yeah. baptism on fourth, and people yeah, just yeah. like, oh, they just come different, let me walk yeah, it out. We don't yeah. know the real importance right. of right. baptism. Right, yeah, we get to the point where sometimes our things that we do mm -hmm. become 
just mere ritual, yeah. mm -hmm. and they get divorced, divorced of their yeah. true meaning, right? So we have to really fight against that tendency to uh, take the meaning out of the Lord's Supper, because we do the same thing with the Lord's Supper. Well, that's this first Sunday. You know, let me take this piece, a little wafer and drink this little juice. And, you know, and it's like, oh, there's so much glory in what you're doing in that moment, right? So, yeah, we got to yeah. So I like that idea. So I'm just going to all right, so don't forget to read the activities, some good stuff in here, because you're going to continue reading in Mark. You're going to look at Jesus got baptized, right? And you're going to see what's interesting in there, right, as well. And we'll be preaching about that as we get to Mark as well. But then your question is, why did Jesus get baptized, you know, um, especially with John's baptism? You know, was he repenting or something? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, so, right. so, right, so go ahead and read on all that and look forward to as we get through uh, get to uh, the book of Mark in the beginning of February and then next session, spending time with Jesus, right, mm -hmm. very important, we spend some quality time with our Lord and Savior who we say we want to follow right, so if we want to follow him, we got to spend time with him, all right, any prayer requests that anyone wants to share to let our group know that they'll be praying for throughout the week Somebody had, sir, um, oh, uh, yes, keep, uh, Sister Jennifer Allen had surgery recently, so keep her in prayer uh, for recovery. Yes, uh, yeah. Brother Corey, he's in Australia. Yes. And he told us last time to pray for him. Pray for, pray for the wife. <laughs> they made it this week. They the made is it. Here the kid. Yeah. Did you count them? Did you, is they all there? <laughs> <laughs> they made a week. Oh, no. One more week. 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 All right. Well, praise Jesus. <laughs> 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 right. We're going to stop by between the hours of 5 and 10 and see if they're all right. Let's see. Check on them. Check and see if they still breathe. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. All right. Well, if we all stand, we will go ahead and. Kind of circle up as we can. Appreciate you guys coming out. Get y'all. Yeah, it's warm in here. All right, let's let's go before our Lord. Father, we thank you. Uh, thank you once again, Lord. Thank you for sending Jesus that he would come to die for sinners like us. Lord, thank you, Lord, for just changing us, God, and doing a work. And Lord, sometimes we realize the work may seem slow, but God, we thank you that we're not like we used to be. And even though sometimes we get sidetracked, God, thank you for bringing us back. Thank you for pursuing us with your love. Thank you for your discipline. Thank you even when it's uncomfortable to, to make you the center, God. And, and you want to you are going to be Lord no matter what, God. Yes. What, God. So we thank you, Lord, for thank your you, work Lord. in our yeah. hearts, in our life. And thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being baptized. Oh, what, yes. what water baptism yes. symbolizes, how you have buried us with you, Lord, in the spirit, and you have raised us to newness of life, God. So let us not trivialize or take baptism so lightly, God, but let us rejoice. And we look forward to even this Sunday, Lord, with this 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 understanding of baptism. We want to come Sunday rejoicing in these disciples that are getting baptized, God. And we want to pray for them and help them in their walk with you. So God, even as we leave this place, let us invite others. Let us share with others. Let us, let us tell them about the wonderful good news yes. of a Savior that brings us out of death yes. into newness of life. Yes. And Lord, we just give your name all the honor and praise. Lord, we pray for those who may be sick, Lord. Yes. Pray for those that are going through surgery, God. Yes. Yes. Pray for yes. Sister Jennifer, God. Continue yes. to strengthen her body, Lord, yes. and let her recover well, God. Yes. And Lord, we thank you, for Lord, for Sister Tasha and her children, Lord. Yes. Thank yes. you for keeping them. Watch over Brother Corey, Lord, yes. as he's away out of the country, Lord. Yes. Keep him, Lord, and we long and look forward to his safe return. Yes. 
God. Thank you, and we just thank you for all thank that you're doing in this church body. Continue to build us up, God, yes, yes, in your grace and your mercy. Yes. And we give your name all the honor and all the praise. Yes. It's in the name of the Father. Yes. It's in the name of the Son. Yes, Lord. In the name of the precious Holy Spirit. And in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.